Okay, we'll continue uh, studying uh, Second Timothy, the last chapter, chapter four. Uh, we looked at verses one to eleven. We studied verses one to eleven. Uh, we'll continue studying um, verses twelve on. Uh, so, can somebody please read um, verses uh, twelve to fifteen, please? Lubega, would you like to read verses twelve to fifteen? I'm here, verses. Can you please read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 to 15, please? 12. Yes, 12 to 15. Okay. And Tarsias, I have sent to Ephesus, bring the cloak that I left with Kappas at Strauss when you come, and the books, especially the, par the parchments. Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm. May the Lord repay him accordingly to his work. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So here uh, Paul, uh, in the previous verses, have, has requested Timothy to come and meet him. Uh, so he's saying Paul is requesting him to bring his cloak uh, since winter was approaching. Um, and also his books. Now, uh, this tells us that, you know, you know, Paul was most likely arrested at Taurus, um, uh, and his arrest resulted in his second imprisonment at Rome. And in those days, you know, um, the arresting soldiers had a claim to any extra garments uh, in the position of the one they were arresting. And it may be that, you know, Paul was uh, warned beforehand of his arrest and therefore he, you know, he left few of his books and his cloak, that is his outer garment, uh, uh, in the care of uh, Carpus, who was an honest man. And um, so he tells Timothy, you know, bring my cloak and, uh, you know, he also asked him uh, uh, to bring his books, especially the parchment. So we see that, you know, Paul uh, remained or stayed a scholar to the very end. He wanted his books and he says, especially get his parchments, which were portions of the Old Testament. So we see that he is still reading uh, the Old Testament uh, Torah, the law, uh, and, um, you know, uh, and he was he's somebody who just wants to, uh, you know, engage in studying and, and receiving more from God's word. We also see that Paul uh, is warning Timothy to stay away from Alexander the coppersmith, who's a troublemaker. Uh, Paul also writes about him. If you remember when we studied First Timothy chapter 1, verse 22, he mentions about Alexander. Uh, and he mentions there uh, as Alexander is someone who had uh, shipwrecked his faith, okay, or his faith has been, uh, has suffered shipwreck. And now Paul is uh, warning Timothy about the same man. And Paul is simply telling that, you know, or writing to Timothy and saying that, you know, he did him much harm and that he could even oppose uh, Timothy. So he's telling Timothy, be watchful, beware of uh, him. Now, you know, uh, this word, uh, you know, uh, or this phrase, he has greatly resisted our words, uh, is perhaps the thought that, you know, it was Alexander who actually witnessed against Paul at his first defense. And uh, somebody, uh, he, and he was also, you know, uh, uh, perhaps also Alexander was a traitor, an informer who betrayed Paul to the Roman government and also was uh, responsible for his current uh, imprisonment. So that is why he is writing again here. He wrote about him in 1 Timothy, writing again here in um, uh, 2 Timothy, the, the, the ending of his letter. And he's saying, uh, you know, be careful. You must be aware of him because he's the man maybe who was uh, the one who 
witness against Paul uh, in his first de defense and also he was somebody who was an informer and betrayed Paul against the Roman government and was responsible for his current uh, imprisonment. Then verses 16 to 18, uh, can somebody read that please? Verses 16 to 18. <laughs> and my defense, at my defense, no one stood with me, we, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So here Paul shares about uh, basically his first trial that, uh, that took place about two years prior to his, uh, you know, his, uh, th this imprisonment in uh, Rome uh, when he was first uh, imprisoned in Rome uh, when he was put uh, in trial uh, before Nero. Uh, Paul says everyone suk forsook him, all of his um, co-workers, his friends, maybe they were scared uh, that they too will be, uh, you know, imprisoned by Nero, they too will be put into prison, so they all forsook their relationship with Paul. But, uh, you know, Paul um, has no grievances uh, against them. Isn't that amazing? You know, um, uh, you know, Paul had no grievance, held no grievances against them. Uh, e even though he was going through a very hard time, you know, uh, he never held uh, on to what they had done to uh, him. And so this is something that we can learn uh, from the life of Paul, from his ministry, yet there will be people who will let us down, people will give up on us, people will not stand beside us, uh, support us, um, you know, but we should not hold any resentment, hatred or bitterness at them at any uh, time. But Paul is saying that, you know, when even when he was all alone, uh, the Lord was with him. And so he says, I think that was his greatest uh, consolation, that was his greatest encouragement, that you know he was not alone the lord was with him and the lord delivered him from the sentence of death and paul is saying that god used that opportunity for him to proclaim uh, the good news uh, in the courtroom you know when all the gentiles and the romans were there uh, hearing him out in the courtroom you know he was able to share the good news and um, it was an opportunity for all the Gentiles and Romans who would never have this opportunity to hear the gospel, to hear the good news in the courtroom. And so Paul declares his, uh, you know, that uh, the same God who strengthened him, who supported him, who helped him, who gave him that confidence, was with him. The same Lord would also be with him, is also with him now, and will also deliver him from every evil work and preserve him uh, for his eternal kingdom. Now here, the emphasis is not that Paul will not suffer, or he will not go through persecution, or he will not even face death, or he will not even be killed. But Paul knows that he is, you know, this imprisonment is going to end in death. He was very sure about that. Um, but, you know, uh, he, he's, um, uh, he's already going through uh, the suffering and the persecution. Uh, and he's also acknowledged that, you know, in verse 6, that his life has been poured out as a drink offering. But what he's saying here is basically he's declaring that, that nothing evil that is designed to rob him of his eternal destination, of his eternal life, of his eternal reward uh, will not succeed. So no evil scheme, no uh, plan of the enemy, uh, no assignment of the enemy can succeed from him, you know, uh, receiving his eternal destination and his eternal um, reward. And he says, you know, God will preserve him for his eternal uh, kingdom. So. Uh, in the same way, you know, when we pray uh, the Lord's Prayer and say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for thine is the kingdom 
uh, you know, it does not mean that we are not going to face temptation. It's not does not mean that we will not be persecuted. We will not go through hardships, tribulations, afflictions, and difficulties. But you know, uh, we need to pray that God will give us a strength uh, and help us to overcome temptation, and that it will not prevail over us. And then he says, you know, to God, to Him be the glory forever and ever. So uh, look at the optimism that Paul has even in this uh, difficult situation. You know, Paul is facing his last moments of his life. He's penniless. He's friendless. There's no friends around him. Uh, he has none of his valuable possessions are with him. He's cold without adequate clothing and he's destined to die soon. But look at his optimism. He's giving God all the glory to whom all glory, uh, you know, uh, belongs for or uh, is forever and uh, ever. And then uh, he gives his greetings in verses uh, 19 to 22. So can somebody read that, please? Verses 19 to 22, to the end of the chapter. Greet Pris Prisca and Aquila and, and the household of Ones Onesphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Malta sick. Do your utmost to come before winter, Usbe Plus great meal and well as well as food, foodens, Lonas, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Thank you, Rubega. So here uh, he's giving his final greetings. He's telling Timothy to greet Prisca and Aquila. Uh, Prisca and Aquila, basically, uh, Aquila and his wife Priscilla here is. Uh, mentioned as Prisca, you know, they were part of Paul's team uh, who served at Corinth. They were uh, a couple who were originally from Rome, but during the persecution that happened in Rome when the Jews were all asked to leave, the Christians were sorry, were asked to leave, they came to Corinth, they, they joined Paul at Corinth. We read about this in Acts chapter 18, verse 2. And they established a church at Corinth. And then they moved uh, with Paul to Ephesus. And we see that they trained Apollos. And then uh, and they sent him to Corinth to oversee the work there. And so Paul remembers them and is grateful and sends his greetings. And then he also talks about Onesiphorus. Uh, Paul mentioned earlier in um, in first in, in the same book in Second Timothy chapter one, verse sixteen. You know, he talks about Onesiphorus as one who served Paul both at Ephesus and at Rome. So uh, Onesiphorus, uh, you know, we we read in verse sixteen that he looked out for Paul in Rome and he served him. So Paul wants to thank him and sends him his greetings. And then Trophimus in verse 20. And then he talks about Erastus who stayed in Corinth. Uh, and he says, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. So this is a strange statement that Paul makes, uh, uh, you know, uh, to acknowledge that, uh, you know, he left one of his fellow workers sick at Miletus. Um, we know that God used Paul mightily in healing and delivering uh, many people, but he says he left one of his, uh, uh, you know, co-workers, Trophimus, uh, sick. Now, how do we read this or respond to this or look at this, you know, um, uh, Paul is human, just like you and I are human. In the same way we minister, he also ministers to the sick people. That is true, the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. But we know that all the people that we pray for, uh, uh, all the sicknesses that we pray for, people are not healed. Uh, you know, um, and in the same way, he would have prayed for Trophimus, but... Um, you know, um, he, uh, he was not at heel. He, leave, he left him still sick. We do not know what was the outcome of Trophimus' sickness. But, uh, you know, even as we see this or read this, it does not mean that Paul was anywhere, uh, you know, uh, not flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. No, he was. But uh, just like you and I, there are times when we pray for people and they're not healed in the same way uh, for Trophimus as well. 
but uh, when what happens when we pray for sick people and they are not healed? Uh, what, uh, how do we look at it? What should be our perspective? What is your perspective when you pray for sick people and they are not healed? How do you look at it? And how should you be looking at it? Any thoughts? Yes, Lubega. I, I think our role as Christians are, is to pray for the sick, anoint them where necessary, but healing is done by God. It's not done by by me. So or I should just take it in positive and I let God's will to be done. Thank you. Okay, so what's God's will for the sick person? Is it God's will that the sick person be healed? I cannot be static on that one. What did you hear? Learn in healing and deliverance class. Yes, it's God's will that you know they be healed because on the cross we read in, in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6, you know, verses 4 and 5 specifically, that he bore our griefs. Griefs is he's bore our sickness and he uh, he he bore our pain, which is you know our uh, our sorrows, that is pain. So he bore, bore our sickness, he bore our our pain on the cross, and he, you know, by his stripes we were healed. You know, um, First Peter chapter two, you know, talks about by his stripes we were healed. That means the healing has already taken place. God has uh, healed us by his stripes. We are already healed. Uh, so, is it God's will to heal people? Yes, it is God's will to heal people. Then, why are uh, people not healed? When people are not healed, it does not change our understanding or our theology of God. God is still Jehovah Rapha. He is still the God who heals. And, uh, you know, uh, he will continue to heal. Uh, so it should not change our understanding about God or not change our understanding of what God has asked us to do or commissioned to do. Because we see that, you know, when Jesus prayed, uh, 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 you know, mul when the sick sick were brought to him, it says that Jesus healed them all. You know, the multitudes were healed. He healed everyone because it's God's will for everyone to be healed and to made, be made whole. That is what he did on the cross, a divine exchange that took place. He took, uh, he became poor for our sakes so that, you know, we can be rich. He who was rich became poor for our sakes. Uh, Paul writes in, in Corinthians. So, you know, um, it's our inheritance, it's our uh, blessing uh, for healing, for wholeness, uh, for deliverance. And uh, so when we, when we pray for sick people, we believe that God wants to heal them and make them whole. Uh, we believe that his power is operating uh, through us because he said we can do greater things than what he has done. You know, uh, we use the tools that he has given us, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we press into that. Um, we use the name of Jesus. We stand and believe on the finished work of the cross. Uh, we do all of those things. But in spite of that, even though we don't um, see sick people healed, it should not change our understanding, our theology, or who, the nature of who God is, or what he's commissioned us to do. Um, um, and of course, yes, we will not have success. Obviously, like Paul, you know, uh, prayed for Trophimus, but he was not healed. Um, but, you know, um, we need to go back to God, you know, and we need to ask him what is lacking in us? What should we do? Uh, uh, you know, how should we have approached this? What did we miss out? And we need to learn from God and wait on the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. It does not mean that God does not want to heal that person. It does not mean that God's will is not that that person be healed and whole. It's not that, um, you know, uh, God does not want to use us to heal uh, that person. I remember uh, a man of God who I listened to and who flows mightily in the gifts of the Spirit and healing ministry, you know, uh, he prayed 
continuously for three people with the same sickness or disease and he did not see them being healed but he said a wonderful thing he says is i didn't give up thinking that you know it's not god's will for me to pray for people with this kind of sickness and god to use me to heal people with this kind of specific sickness but he says i went to the secret place and i engaged with god and I pressed in and I asked him, God, what do I need to do? Because he says, one of them uh, who came for prayer with great confidence, with great faith, believing that, you know, her daughter would be healed, but was not healed. And it was very heartbreaking. So I went back, pressed in and asked God. And I don't stop there. I, I continue praying for that sicknesses and those diseases. And I believe God is going to bring a breakthrough and heal people. So, um, when healing does not come uh, through, we go back to God, we ask him what is lacking and we should do what uh, we need to uh, do and press in uh, till we see uh, God's promise come true that we will do greater things than what he has uh, done. Okay. And then in verses 21 and 22, he says, you know, try to come before winter and Eubulus uh, greets you. And so does Pudens, Linus, Claudia and all the brethren. And then, you know, he says, he speaks the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be on Timothy. Okay. So that is the end of Paul's uh, last letter to his beloved son in the faith when he's mentored young Timothy. Um, some wonderful learnings, some wonderful truths that we can uh, learn for our life and our ministry and put into action and practice. Any questions, any doubts before we move on to the book of Titus? Anything anyone wants to say, share? Nothing. Okay, if uh, there is no questions or doubts, we'll move on to the book of Titus. Okay, uh, we'll just look at the introduction and then maybe we can uh, begin studying Titus chapter 1. It's only, I think, three chapters, so we'll study chapter 1 and 2 next week and uh, we would have enough time to finish Philemon. Okay, so um, Paul's epistle to Titus and Timothy uh, is called as what epistles? Anyone knows? They are called the, the apostolic epistle, epistles. Thank you, Lubega. They're called as pastoral epistles, yes. Okay. Um, even though they are basically uh, personal letters, you know, or they're originally regarded as personal letters along with Philemon because they're addressed to individuals, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, but um, they're called as pastoral epistles because Paul is writing or, uh, to Titus and uh, Timothy, guiding them in matters concerning um, pastoral care of the churches that they are overseeing at Crete, uh, Titus who's overseeing at Crete and uh, Timothy who's overseeing the churches at, uh, at Ephesus. So uh, these books are not limited to personal and just private um, con uh, communications, but is also somewhat official in uh, character. Um, why? Because these books will be read out to the congregation of the believers as well. Okay, So these books are pastoral in nature because they give directions on how to uh, deal with false teachers. We saw considerable amount of time that Paul is writing and telling Timothy about false teachers and what to do and how to deal with them. Uh, also, he he's telling them how to establish godly leadership in the local churches. We looked at, uh, you know, the qualifications that he enlists for uh, Timothy in, uh, regarding deacons and bishops and, you know, church administration about widows and young widows and young men and young women. 
and also um, he's encouraging them uh, uh, on godliness and we looked at it quite a bit in um, his t two letters to uh, Timothy okay so that is why it is uh, these books are pastoral in nature because of these three areas which they give direction to uh, who is the author of um, the book of Titus our own Shaul yes Paul Otto. yes how do we know it's Paul how do we know it's Paul that's an easy I from the introduction yes. as is introducing the book saying that Paul Thank you, Lubega. Uh, uh, so yes, Paul wrote this letter to Titus because it's mentioned there in the beginning, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So we can surely say that Paul is the author because uh, the letter is, uh, itself claims to have been written by Paul. Um, Titus, uh, what do you know about Titus, anyone? Can we have some class interaction, please, here? Uh, what do you know about Titus? Similar to uh, Timothy, yeah. Paul considered Titus as one of his uh, uh, son, kind of, and he groomed him uh, to to pastorate, kind of, uh, you know, uh, to uh, to the. I mean, in Titus, he predominantly uh, teaches Titus on how to. Uh, you know, uh, deal with elderly people, how to address uh, the elderly women uh, and uh, the youngsters as, as like, yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Lyndon, you're right. Uh, yes, like, just like Timothy, uh, Titus was also someone Paul mentored. Uh, yes, and also he looks upon him as uh, a son, just like he looks at Timothy, and also he writes about uh, writes to Timothy how to pastor, um, how to uh, you know lead the church, how to uh, lead people in uh, uh, choose people in leadership and minister to various uh, uh, people in the church. Yes, anyone else? Unlike, unlike Ty Timothy, who had a Jewish mother and grandmother and a Greek father, so Timothy, we say that he was. 50% 50, 50 a Greek and 50% uh, a Jew, but when it comes to Titus, is 100% a Greek. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Lubega. Good. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Titus was a Greek speaking Gentile believer. And, uh, you know, he was probably converted by Paul either in Antioch, uh, Syria, modern day Syria, or during his first uh, missionary journey in Galatia, or Pamphylia, in, in Pamphylia, basically, or Galatia. Okay. So, what do we know about uh, Titus from scriptures? Uh, we know that Paul took Titus with him when he attended the council at Jerusalem and ask the elders in Jerusalem to take the decision not to require uh, the non-Jewish believers to be circumcised. We read about this in Acts chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, which is the council at Jerusalem. And uh, Paul is asking the, Jew the elders there, um, you know, uh, to take a decision uh, and, and make this decision that non-Jews uh, who become Christians, who convert believers, uh, they they don't require to be uh, circumcised. And we see that the elders agreed with Paul and did not insist that Titus should be circumcised. Okay, And uh, we can also get a little more uh, information about Paul's relationship with Titus and also about Titus's character and personality from what Paul writes uh, about him in his uh, letter to Titus or in his epistle. Uh, so just like Lyndon said, you know, uh, Titus was a son uh, to, uh, in the faith to uh, Paul. So we read this in Titus chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, Paul says, Titus was a true son in our common faith. Um, 
from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, uh, we read that you know, Titus was a genuine brother to the apostle Paul. Uh, so you see how you know people move, and Paul does not just see them as sons in the faith and keep them as sons in the faith, as subordinates. You know, once they come to a level of spiritual maturity, they become brothers, co-workers, co-laborers, uh, just like Timothy as well. So uh, we see that Timothy was a genuine brother. To, sorry, Titus was a genuine brother to the apostle Paul. We read this in Second Corinthians. Uh, chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, we read that Titus was a partner and a fellow worker with uh, Paul. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, uh, we read that Titus walked in the same spirit as Paul, which means that he was just learning so much, receiving so much from Paul's life that he walked in that same a spirit, maybe the spirit of humility, commitment, uh, you know, um, ownership to the gospel, uh, a spirit of uh, submission, consecration to the Lord, uh, to being that bond servant. So just, uh, you know, walking the same spirit as Paul. In Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, we see that, uh, we read that uh, type, Titus walked in the same steps as Paul or in the same manner of life. That means he was just imbibing or copying or imitating uh, Paul's um, lifestyle in every way. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 7, uh, we read that Titus could uh, be a pattern to other believers. So uh, he was so much just uh, walking in the same steps as Paul, in the same manner of life as Paul, uh, in the same spirit as Paul did, um, that, you know, he came to a place where, you know, he could be uh, an example, a model for other believers to uh, model as well. So you see the wonderful life and testimony of Paul, you know, that, um, uh, that his mentoring uh, people, um, that he was uh, that not just teaching them, but you know, letting them to see his very life, letting him, let, uh, just walking so close to him that they're able to see his attitude, his mindset, his actions, his reactions, uh, so much so that you know, uh, they just wanted to uh, copy him, imitate him, model him, and you know, continue to be models, and that is what. Uh, a, a wonderful uh, pattern that Paul set that, you know, he raised up sons in the faith would go on to raise up many more sons and daughters in the faith and be uh, models themselves to um, others. And this is something that we need to also, we can learn from Paul's life, something that we can also uh, uh, follow in our lives so that we can be a model to others as well. So Titus was one of Paul's very, if you, if you look at all of these scripture passages that I, that I just mentioned and uh, what, you know, is mentioned about Titus there, we see that Titus was one of Paul's closest and most trusted co-workers. And this is evidenced by the fact that Paul sent him to one of the most troubled churches of Corinth and so first Paul sent him to Corinth, which was uh, going through a lot of trouble and difficulties, and also to, uh, to Crete, which was facing a lot of uh, challenges. Um, so after Titus helped Paul at Ephesus during his third missionary journey, he was sent from there to Corinth, uh, you know, with Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and we read this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18. And after assisting the believers in Corinth, you know, Titus took news back about the church and what things were happening in the church to Paul, who was at that time at Philippi. Um, and then we read this about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. And then we see that Titus then took Paul's second letter to the Corinthians uh, from Philippi back to, uh, to Corinth. And uh, he also helped um, uh, 
you know, with a collection of money from the church at Corinth for the poor saints in Jerusalem. So there's quite a lot of work that he was doing in Corinth, going back and forth, writing to Paul, mentioning to Paul about how things are improving at the church at Corinth, the problems, the difficulties, and the work that he did at, uh, at Corinth. Now, after Paul's release from house arrest in Rome during his first Roman imprisonment, you know, Titus traveled along with Paul to Crete. Uh, from uh, so we learn from First Timothy, sorry, from First uh, the first chap chapter of Titus, verse five. We learn that Paul and Titus worked together uh, in Crete, and they spread the gospel. They also also established churches. Uh, but Paul had to leave Titus at Crete to continue the work because maybe he felt that, uh, you know, that the, the work was not done, it was not complete. And, uh, you know, um, things were difficult there. Things had to be put in order, set in order. And there was no other better person than Titus who he could leave at uh, Crete. And, um, you know, we read in the book of Titus that Paul wrote and summoned Titus to rejoin Paul at uh, Nicopolis. Uh, and so either uh, Artemis or Tychicus, uh, as we read in Titus chapter 3, verse 12, took over Titus' this, Titus's responsibility at Crete when he went to meet Paul at uh, Nicopolis. And when Titus was at Nicopolis, uh, you know, Paul may have commissioned him for uh, some evangelistic work at Dalmatia. And later on, um, as the tradition says, you know, uh, uh, we see that uh, Titus returned back to Crete and, you know, it's described him as the bishop there until his old age. So basically, maybe he loved Crete. He felt a burden or responsibility for the people at Crete. Maybe they were like his own babes in the faith, children in the faith. Um, and so uh, tradition says, however, that, you know, Titus went back to Crete and then he, uh, you know, would have been a bishop there till his old age. Okay. So we look a little bit about Crete. Uh, anyone knows anything about Crete? Where is Crete? And have you heard anything about this place called Crete? Any idea? OK, so Crete is one of the um, you know, largest islands in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, the Cretan people, very sadly, you know, had acquired a very disgraceful and a bad reputation in the Roman world. Um, and Paul also, you know, uh, quotes or cites one of the poets uh, called Epimendus uh, in Titus chapter 1, verse 12, where Epimendus, uh, who is a Cretan himself, but writes about the people of Crete, and he says, Cretans are liars evil beasts and lazy gluttons. So Paul is basically quoting uh, Epimendus, who is uh, a poet, a Cretan poet, and what he st spoke about the Cretan people. So we gather some information about uh, the people of Crete, that they were basically liars, evil beasts, and lazy uh, gluttons. Now, um, how do you think the gospel reached the people of Crete? Uh, the was it only when Paul and Titus went to Crete and ministered there that uh, the people of Crete uh, uh, came to know about Jesus and the gospel, or was it before that? Any thoughts, any ideas? Any uh, thoughts? By just, a matter, just a matter of guessing, mm -hmm. I think it, 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 it was Paul. It was Paul. Oh, so you're saying it was um, Paul, okay? Um, basically, you know, uh, the uh, the gospel had reached Crete even before Paul and Titus went there. How do we know that? Is because Cretans were present in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, uh, where you know uh, they heard the disciples speak. 
uh, in you know in their own languages um, and they were uh, talking about the mighty deeds of God they were praising God and uh, you know uh, people who came from all over uh, the surrounding places to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover was were, uh, were surprised because these Galileans were actually speaking so fluently in the languages from the places they had come from when they did not know those languages. So if you look at um, Acts chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 11, basically verses 9, 10, and 11 talks about, you know, uh, all the languages that were uh, the disciples spoke when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit because people from those places had come. And verse 11 says, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues uh, the wonderful works of God. So on the day of Pentecost, there were people who came from uh, the Jews who had come from Crete. So possibly they would have heard uh, Peter's uh, sermon and there would be one of them uh, who had accepted the sermon among the 3,000 or, you know, people usually stayed back for some time. They would have heard the apostles that the preaching of the gospel, seen mighty signs, miracles and wonders that the apostles were doing. They would have, um, uh, you know, accepted accepted the gospel, accepted Jesus Christ, converted. And, uh, and when they went back, you know, they would have gone back and preached the gospel to their people and they would have planted uh, uh, churches, okay? Um, so they say that, you know, uh, it was possible that during that time, you know, um, the gospel was preached or the gospel was taken to uh, Pete. Um, so... When was this letter written? It was probably written between 63 to and 66 AD after Paul left Titus at Crete. Uh, he went on to Macedonia from where he most likely wrote to Titus in response to a letter that he received from Titus or a report that he received from Titus about the uh, the, the the church at Crete. And so Paul writes to Titus instructing him how to put into order, you know, the remaining matters that need to be uh, uh, taken care of um, and the, the matters regarding the churches at Crete. So Paul wrote this um, uh, and this letter and he sends it along with the two other uh, uh, workers or co-workers of Paul, uh, Zenus and Apollos, were mentioned in Titus chapter 3, verse 13, um, you know, who were about to go to Crete. And so Paul sends this letter with them. So Zenus and Apollos were planning to go to Crete. And so Paul sends the letter to uh, them. So this is very briefly an introduction to uh, uh, Paul's letter to Titus. Anyone has any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then uh, we'll begin. We just have about um, seven minutes, so we'll not begin studying chapter one of um, Titus. We'll begin uh, next week. Uh, yeah, next week we have class, and the week after that is uh, Good Friday, so we won't be having class on Good Friday. But next week, uh, if we plan to do Titus chapter one and two, then maybe we have... Uh, time enough to do chapter three and then we can finish well in time in uh, April with the file limit. Yes. Okay. Thank you everyone for um, joining class. Uh, since we um, finished the book of uh, Second Timothy, um, uh, uh, the assessment is due for the book of Second Timothy. So could you just suggest a, a possible date when you can have it, please? Any suggestions? When you want to have it? So your um, assessment on the second or the last assessment on in children's ministries on 21st March. Um, so would you want to have it after that? Yes, ma'am. After that will be good. Okay, so when is after that? Because I think um, 
the week from 25th to 31st is the Passion Week. So I think some of you might be busy. First week of April. Okay, first week of April sounds good, yes. Is first week of April fine with all of you? Can you suggest a date, please? We go with first week, no problem. Okay, so can I post it on um, the 2nd of April, which is a Tuesday, and you can submit it on the 5th of April, which is a Friday, is that fine? Sure. Yeah. Yes, for me. Okay, thank you everyone. So I post it on the 2nd of April, and then you can submit it on the 5th, yeah. Thank you everyone for uh, joining class today. Have a blessed and a refreshing weekend, and I'll see you Excuse next Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse yes, me, ma'am. Yes, Tobega. There is a way you post to work and that it doesn't open as we've agreed. It only opens like uh, 30 minutes to, okay, less than the, the, the time we had agreed. How about that? If we agree on the date, better you post and then you uh, give us access. Yeah, the thing is I give you the access, but I don't know why it uh, it changes. Now, when I post it, I go to the settings and the, you know, restrict it to all people's church users. I actually have to uh, switch off that button, which I do. And when I post the um, a test, I go back to settings and check it and it's, it's the button is still off. But I don't know why it suddenly turns on automatically. I actually, uh, you know, have uh, communicated this to the IT team. Uh, I've um, I've kept them in the loop. I've been telling them that this is happening. Um, and I don't know why it's happening, but uh, it's not happened with uh, the two assess the assessment I posted for Christology for the first years. But it's happening with you all. I don't know why, but I've informed Monica who's, who deals with this. Um, so I think what we need to do is I need to keep on continually going and keeping on randomly just checking every now and then if the button doesn't turn on. It turns on automatically. I don't know how it happens. So um, I've spoken to the IT team. We'll try to find something. And uh, if it happens and you have very less time, you can feel free to take some more time. It's, it's OK. I'm not going to uh, deduct marks. But I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. There's, um, Nothing more I can do than just turn it off, but I don't know how it automatically turns. So for two days, it was actually, when I was checking, the button was off, but then I don't know how it randomly just automatically turned on. And so some of you, when you tried doing it after that, was uh, you were not able to access. Uh, but we'll keep a check on that when we post the next assessment so you all don't have any uh, problems or difficulties. But I'm so sorry for the inconvenience. Yes. Thank you, Rubega, for pointing that out. Uh, anything else? But please, please feel free to take more time. Uh, I won't deduct marks um, uh, because of that. No. Yes. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mom. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, everyone. Have a blessed day and a blessed weekend. See you all. Bye bye. Hello. Yes, yes, I go ahead, Paul. Talking. Yes, I'm yeah, here. I, I can still uh, listen to you.